you are welcome to this lesson two on the epistle to the hebrews chapter 2 verse 5 through chapter 3 verse 2. we are following the discourse analysis of dr cynthia westfall section one consider jesus as the apostle of our confession point a let us hold on to the message that our apostle gave us last time we dealt with point one let us pay attention to the message of God's ultimate messenger. In this session, we begin point two. Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest. For he, God, did not put the world to come, about which we are speaking, under the control of angels. Instead, someone testified somewhere, What is man that you think of him? or the Son of Man, that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels for a while. You crowned him with glory and honor, and you put all things under his control. In chapter 1, we learned that God has exalted his Son, who created the world, far above all angels. And in chapter 2, verse 5, we're learning about the world to come. According to the book of Genesis, human beings were created to rule over the entire earth. But following their fall into sin, fallen angels gained authority over the human beings, and eventually God placed angels in charge of the nations until such time as Messiah would come. Hence the declaration of Scripture that God has made human beings, mankind, for a little while lower than the angels. But he is to be crowned with glory and honor when he will put all things under human control. This Scripture comes from Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6, or 5 through 7 in the original languages where our English Bibles read, a little lower than angels, it translates the Greek New Testament, which in turn was quoting the Greek Old Testament, which has angelos, angels, whereas the original Hebrew read Elohim, the word that normally translates God or gods in the plural question here is whether the Septuagint translators were trying to protect the name of God or whether they understood Elohim to be divine angelic beings. By way of theological summary, this fits into seven phases of human history. Now there may be more, there may be fewer, but for our purposes will we use seven as an analytical tool? seven phases of human history. First, God created humans to reign over earth. Point two, humans originally had equality with angels and were able to communicate with various kinds of divine beings through which the temptation came from the nakash, the serpent. Thirdly, God made humans lower than angels for a while. Until four, Jesus died and was raised back to life. Fifthly, Jesus has now been crowned with glory. And six, Jesus eventually will bring us believers to glory that we may reign with him. Until point seven, God will put everything in subjection to us human beings. Thus our text explains, when God put all things under his control, that is, man's control, he left nothing outside of his control. At present we do not yet see all things under his control, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by God's grace he would experience death on behalf of everyone. 
for it was fitting for him, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For indeed he who makes holy, and those who are being made holy, all have the same origin. So he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. Again he says, I will be confident in him. And again, here I am with the children God has given me. These verses allow us to summarize God's work on behalf of us human beings in seven points. First, he is the one for and by whom all things exist. Therefore, these are his sovereign choices, his sovereign actions. Secondly, because of the human fall, God has made us humans lower than angels. Thirdly, God remains the one source of the sanctifier, Jesus, and of the sanctified, us humans. Fourthly, however, God has perfected Jesus through suffering. It's not that Jesus had any faults or defaults, but rather, in order to become a completely effective high priest, he had to suffer as we do. And fifthly, God gives children to Jesus. Now, God gave Adam children, but they were all born in sin, and they died. Whereas, when God gives children to Jesus Christ, they have eternal life and will be raised to life. Sixthly, God will bring those many sons to glory, that is, the new sons of God. The former sons of God, who were angelic beings, are displaced from their positions of authority and management over earth. So lastly, God will subject the world to come to us humans, and that condition will last forever. Verses 14 through 18 in the Net Bible read as follows. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus, likewise shared in their humanity, so that through death he could destroy the one who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and set free those who were held in slavery all their lives by their fear of death. For surely his concern is not for angels, but he is concerned for Abraham's descendants. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Uh, from these verses, we can summarize Jesus' work on behalf of us humans. First, he himself became flesh and blood. That is, the earthly Jesus was not an angel. Secondly, Jesus was made like his brethren. That is to say, he really suffered and he really died. And he really experienced temptation. Point three. When our first parent Adam experienced temptation, he sinned and violated the will of God by disobeying God's clear commandment. Fourthly, Jesus has suffered death, real, physical, human death. By doing so, point five, he made propitiation for humans' sins, that is to say, he has removed the guilt problem, the death problem, and the alienation problem. Sixthly, in so doing, he destroyed the power of the devil. Now, the devil no longer has power to cause our eternal death, but he is still powerful 
His main work in the world today is to deceive humans into believing things that ain't so. Seventhly, Jesus delivers those subject to death. That is to say, just as God saved him from death, not from dying, but saved him out of death, likewise we too, though we may die, God will save us out of death and bring us into the coming glorious kingdom. Point eight, Jesus sanctifies. That is to say, he makes us holy in the sense that we now belong exclusively to God. And point nine, Jesus is able to help us humans when we are tempted. He does not give the same help to angels. In the New Testament, there is no teaching on the redemption or salvation of fallen angels, only of fallen human beings. In chapter 3, verses 2, we come to the third sub-point of our discourse analysis. Being partners in a heavenly calling, we are to think of Jesus as an apostle and a high priest. Net Bible, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partners in a heavenly calling, take note of Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess, who is faithful to the one who appointed him, as Moses was also in God's house. These verses affirm that we are Jesus' holy brethren. We share in his heavenly calling, both now and in the future, so we are to consider Jesus. We are to think about him. We are to examine what he has done. We are to reflect upon his teachings. For as the scripture says, we have no other teacher who supersedes Jesus. Fourthly, we obey our apostle. Now, there are four kinds of apostle in the New Testament. The first kind is Jesus himself, that is, Jesus is the one whom God sent into the world as his ultimate messenger. Secondly, the twelve apostles whom Jesus personally appointed and gave authority to perform miracles, as he did later the apostle Paul. And finally, the New Testament uses the term apostles for missionaries sent out from churches to do the work of the gospel in faraway places. Or oh, there's another kind of apostle described in the New Testament, and that's a false apostles. Those are spacious speakers who come into your church, make pronouncements over your city, take up a collection, and seek your admiration. Point five, we confess our high priest. Jesus Christ alone is our intermediary with God. Sixthly, we count him faithful, that is, he has accomplished all that God required of him in behalf of us humans whom he brings to salvation. And seventhly, we are to compare him with Moses. In the next chapters, we shall learn ways in which Jesus has become superior to Moses. Coming up in lesson three, let us respond to Jesus' voice today and so enter God's rest. As we progress in this book, we shall look at main point number two, how to consider Jesus as the high priest of our confession, and thirdly, how we are partners in Jesus' heavenly calling. So, your assignment for this week, point one, to read Hebrews 2, 5 through 3, 2, in three different translations, three different languages if you know them. We invite you to read the passage online at netbible.org, pursuing its many scholarly notes. As you do so, point three, write down your observations, comments, and queries that you want us to dis that you would like to discuss with others. And lastly, share with a friend something you learned from this passage. 
As you do so, God will bless you richly. You may download these notes along with other documents from hebrews.cura.download.